Um, good to see you all again. And this is a shaman's view. I'm Dr. Alberto Violdo. I am a medical anthropologist. I am a shaman. And I want to invite you to join me today in the Jaguar's journey. Jaguar medicine is the medicine of the Amazon peoples, of the rainforest peoples, of people who were never kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Do you know that we're the only people in the planet to have ever been kicked out of the garden? That no one else in the earth was kicked out of Eden. The Aborigines, the Sub-Saharan Africans, the Native Americans, they were given the garden to be the stewards and the caretakers of the garden. I did a program recently where someone asked me, Alberto, how can we help people reconnect with nature. Can we go to the park? Can we go for walks in the woods? Can we bless our food? Can, and I said, it's impossible to disconnect with nature. You can never disconnect with nature because you are nature. This is nature. This is biology. You only become disconnected from yourself. And when you become disconnected from yourself, you become sick. It's at that point that we develop the ailments of civilization, <clears throat> not knowing who we are, being lost in the world, and the heart disease, and the dementias, and the cancers that don't exist among Amazonian peoples. When I was a young medical anthropologist in the Amazon, I was amazed that the villages I went to had none of these ailments of civilization. I went to villages that had seldom seen a light-skinned person. And I remember the kids running up to me and rubbing my arms and my fingers and to see if the white dirt would come off. And um, they, had, they were healthy. They lived in communion, in union. They were not kicked out of the garden. They had not separated. They had not become divorced from their selves. They had not suffered soul loss. And this is what we're dealing with today. So people ask me, what do shamans think about this crisis that we're living through today? And I remember two things, one being in the Amazon and this old medicine woman looking into my eyes and saying, you know, Alberto, we're going to miss our white brother. And I go, what do you mean? He says, yeah, we're going to miss our white brother because your people have come to the end of their story unless they write a new story about themselves and about the stewardship of the earth, the caretaking of the earth. These, were the, these people were the caretakers of the earth the stewards of the garden. They had not been cast out. They walked with beauty on the earth and they spoke to the rivers and to the trees and to, the, and to God. And the rivers and the trees and to God, and God spoke back to them. One of the most beautiful things that happens in an ayahuasca ceremony in the Amazon is when you recover the dialogue with spirit, where you actually hear the voice of spirit, but it's not someone speaking at you, it's you, it's the voice of that oneness that answers any question that you have for it. It's an exquisite thing. I remember being in the jungle in the middle of ceremony, <clears throat> and we were in the backwaters of the Amazon we had navigated along the Mother of God River and onto the Baker River. And I was there with a few close friends. <clears throat> and we were doing ceremony with alligators on the beach right near us. There were three very large lizards about 10 feet long, just kind of with their beady eyes looking at us. We were very near to them, maybe maybe 15 feet away. They didn't want to go anywhere, but they wanted to be part of the ceremony. So we figured they were there, why not? And all during our ceremony, I would look up to check to see that they were still 
where I saw them last. And in one of those moments of communion, I asked Spirit, can you let me hear your voice? Where are you? And the voice responded, I have never left you. I have always been here. Welcome back, my little one. Welcome home, my son. This is the great return that we have the opportunity to do today. But to do that, we have to step into Jaguar medicine. And the reason for this is that Jaguar is the only one that dares to explore those dark and hidden places in the rainforest, the places that no one dares to go to. Jaguar practices fearlessness. And the Jaguar has no predators. It's at the very top of the food chain. It has no predators. It doesn't have to live in fear or in fight or flight. And it can live in great ease in the rainforest. So Jaguar medicine is essential today. And in the Americas, you find that there are cultures like the Olmec, the Olmec people, O-L-M-E-C, the most ancient peoples in Mesoamerica and Central America, they were the Jaguar people. They, half of their iconography and their ceramics are babies with Jaguar heads, humans with the body of the Jaguar and the head of a human, people that were half human and half Jaguar. Among the Mayans, the highest of the priests and priestesses were known as the Balams. The Balams were the Jaguar priests because they had defeated death. They had journeyed beyond death and returned. The Jaguar lore and the Jaguar medicine is all through the Americas, all through the shamanic traditions of North and Central and South America. And even today in parts of the Amazon, the medicine men and women will dress up as jaguars on their journey beyond death into infinity. Because this is what happened when we were cast out of the garden. When we were still in the garden, we were immortal. We were not stalked by death. And the minute that we were kicked out of the garden, we were stalked by death, old age, and disease. Now these were the three elements that the Buddha discovered that when Siddhartha left the palace and his chariot here was taking him through the villages and he saw an old man that was hobbling down the streets and he saw a woman that was dead, that was on the side of the road, dead, and, and he saw a, a, a man who had sores in his skin, and he asked his charioteer, what is, what's the matter with that man? And the charioteer said, he's sick. And Siddhartha asked, will that happen to me too? Will I get sick? Will I get old? Will I die? <clears throat> and his charioteer says, yes, master, you will. And that's what launched Siddhartha on his journey to become a Buddha, on the great journey. Now, these were the three things that began to happen to us when we were cast out of the garden. We began to be stalked by death. We became sick and we're aging. We're aging rapidly. Now, the shamans don't get old. Their body goes through the stages of life, but their soul is youthful and intact and it's not been wounded. It's not been spoiled. This is what we need to recover today. When I was asked recently in a, in a program, Alberto, as a shaman, you're a medicine man. I said, yeah, I'm a medical anthropologist and it's Dr. Alberto, because you get people's attention when you use your, your title. He says, what, as a shaman, what do, you, what do you recommend that we do? Do we go for a walk in nature? Do we?" She said, what I recommend you do is you come back to the garden. Go back to the garden. We can make that choice to go back to the garden and our garden begins to appear around us and we begin to commune with the rivers and the trees and to hear the voice 
of spirit once again. And that's the choice that we make when we come back to ourselves. But to do this, the shamans in the Amazon devised these strategies, these rites of passage that would allow you to go through the window of death without losing the physical body. But it meant that you had to be willing to relinquish everything. Symbolically, you didn't have to give the children up for adoption. You didn't have to give your car away or find a new home for the dog or for the spouse. No, you had to do it as a gesture of power. And I invite you to do that with me today when we're going to put death in the fire. This is the death of death. I was speaking with my friend Robert Thurman, the Buddhist scholar, and he likes to say that nobody gets out of this life dead. We all get out of it alive. But we want to find that way back to the garden today. The other ingredient besides putting death in the fire is to take on the stewardship of all beings. The stewardship of the earth become the caretakers of the garden, not the spoilers of the garden, not the ones that are cutting the garden down for lumber or extracting minerals from the earth, but the stewards of the garden. And that's an act, a gesture of love and a gesture of power that the shaman makes and that you can make, that we can make and that we have to make today. And let me give you a compelling reason why this is so important. For the shaman, there's no difference between being killed by a microbe and being killed by a jaguar. They're exactly the same thing. For us to be killed by a microbe or by a virus is a disease, and to be killed by a jaguar is an accident. It's bad luck. As a shaman, we have to be in right relationship with microbes and with jaguars. Otherwise, they're both going to be looking at us as lunch. <clears throat> so when we take on that task of stewardship, when we accept the challenge to die to what has been and to emerge into what is still a surprise to us, it's terrifying. We have no idea what we're going to be emerging into. But we must be available to that in the same way <clears throat> in the same way that the caterpillar is available to the process of becoming a butterfly. It's never in its whole life heard about wings or about colors. All it knows is this caterpillarness. And today we have to surrender to this process and we begin by putting it all in the fire. When you die, literally, you will lose your name, you will lose your body, your house, your car, and that will be, if, that will be the, the great departure from everything that we have identified with. <clears throat> Today I want to invite you to do it with me in the fire symbolically. To place everything that has died in our world and in our life, including the old models of health and the, the old paradigms of doing business and the corporate world and and the few living at the expense of the many and the uh, tremendous inequalities, all of this and the way that it lives within us, I invite you to put into the fire with me today. <clears throat> so I'm going, to, I'm going to light a candle. <clears throat> and if you have your candle, if you have your candle with you, I invite you to light it and to place a death arrow. When the shamans place an offering in the fire, they place two offerings actually. One is a death arrow that represents everything that has died, that we're releasing. So we can never be claimed by death because we have been claimed by life. Death is seen as something that festers within us. And remember, the jaguar shamans, the jaguar priests, are the ones that have transcended death. They journey beyond death. They can never be claimed by left. death. Death is something that festers within us, that begins to claim us little by little, instead of all at once. 
I tell the participants in our Grow a New Body program that we do in our shamanic monastery in Chile, where the air is clean and the food is clean and it's, we're in wild nature, I tell them that we have to release the death that has been selected for us, that we have volunteered for, that death that will make us a statistic. And we know the statistics. And in some way, unconsciously, we volunteer to become a statistic. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to be in the fat part of the bell curve. We want to be in one of the extremes, not in the big, big fat part. We want to be an outlier. We want to be an outlier. Because there's enough of us in this virtual room to make up a statistical sample. And we know that 29% are going to go from cancer and heart disease and then dementia, one out of every two people at the age of 85. And only one or two of us are going to die in the arms of our beloved at the age of 120 after great lovemaking. And that's what becoming an outlier is. But that's the personal benefit. The greater benefit, of course, is that we become the caretakers of the mother of the earth. And as soon as we do this, and we don't do it by doing anything, but by claiming it, <clears throat> by stepping into that relationship, by making an internal act of power and a gesture of love, and then our mother begins to mirror that back to us personally and collectively. So I invite you tonight when you do the ceremony or now if you have your candle and your death arrow to blow into it. <clears throat> everything that has died, everything that is no longer living in your world. For some of us it's our job, for some of us it's a health crisis, for some of us it's the fear of getting sick. For some of us, it's the fear of dying, of losing everything, including our body and our name. <clears throat> and when you have done so, to bring it to the fire. Remember that our most ancient Neanderthal brain only changes through ceremony. And the fire ceremony is humanity's most ancient ceremony. We have been sitting around a fire for three million years. And place your death arrow in the fire, allowing it, everything that it has died, that is no longer living, to return to the light. To release the light that is bound in all of those old stories, tragic stories, to release that light and release that power and that energy so that we can write a new story for humanity and for ourselves. Releasing everything that has died. Do this this evening. I do the fire ceremony every day because today we are in the Pachacuti, in the great upheaval. Kali has been unleashed in the planet. Death is all around us. But death is simply the opportunity for renewal. When we enter that process of releasing the dead and the deadness inside of us, it becomes a pathway to freedom and to liberation. It requires courage, it requires that jaguar medicine, it requires a stewardship of all life, the same way that the mother jaguar protects her young, her babies. And it requires nonviolence. The jaguar has no predators, nothing to be fearful of. Practice courage, be daring. Thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you again in the next fire ceremony.